Okay, welcome comrades to Trades Hall in Melbourne on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. Um, just some housekeeping first. Uh, the toilets are out the back in the main area there and then to the right if you need to go there. Um, my name is Ryan Mickler. I'm a member of the Platypus Affiliated Society here in Melbourne. Platypus was invited to chair and moderate this debate between the International Communist League, here locally represented by the Spartacist League of Australia, and the International Bolshevik Tendency. While many, perhaps all, of the people in this room might be familiar with both the SL and the IBT, it is worth saying that both of these groups trace their origins back to the revolutionary tendency, a faction formed within, and then later expelled from, the Socialist Workers' Party in the United States in the early 1960s. The American SWP had been the leading section of Trotsky's Fourth International following the defeat of World Revolution after 1917 and the degeneration of the Stalinized Communist International in the 1920s and 30s. In the changed conditions following World War II under the leadership of James Cannon, the SWP sought to continue to pose the task of revolutionary leadership of the working class against both Stalinism and reformism. But by the early 1960s, it had entered into a crisis. In the context of, of, context of Khrushchev's secret speech at the Soviet invasion of Hungary in 1956, and revisionist tendencies within Trotskyism, including so-called Pabloism and Third Campism, as well as an emerging new left and the civil rights movement and, uh, in the US and national liberation movements in the third world. This crisis gave rise to the revolutionary tendency and then to the Spartacist League under the lead, leadership of James Robertson, which sought to return to the questions posed by Cannon in 19, his 1946 theses on the American question, sorry, theses on the American Revolution for their own time. The debate around permanent revolution, a term associated with Trotsky, but going all the way back to Marx after 1848, and the, rev, and the struggle for the revolutionary leadership has characterized the Spartacist League and the different organizations that claim to uphold its legacy ever since. But what does it all mean today? Indeed, given the historic defeat and decay of the left and revolutionary Marxism and Trotskyism, how can we even assume that these are still the right questions? So in that spirit, today's topic of debate is permanent revolution and the struggle for revolutionary leadership today. The format of this debate is as follows. Each side will be given 30 minutes for opening presentations, which they can divide up between several speakers. Any unused time will be allowed to be reclaimed for closing arguments. The order will be determined by a coin toss. Charles, would you like head or tail? Tail. Would you like to go first or second? First. Okay, so the SL will be speaking first in the opening, and then the IBT will, and the closing statements will be in the reverse order. After the opening statements, we'll have five rounds of speakers from the floor. Each round will consist of three presentations of four minutes in the order of a speaker from the SL, then a speaker from the IBT, and then a speaker on behalf of another organization or an individual. If you're on here on behalf of an organization and would like to speak, please let my comrade Duncan know here in the middle row. row. Uh, at 5.10 p.m., we'll have closing statements of 10 minutes each in the reverse order of the opening statements after which we have a room booked at the John Curtin Hotel across the room. And with that, I hand it over to the SL for their opening statement. Hello, comrades. Permanent revolution and the fight for revolutionary leadership today. This question is not an academic one not one of theoretical differences in abstract understanding of the theory of permanent revolution. No, at its core, this debate is between two fundamentally opposed methods. There's one, the IBTs, that sees the world through the lens of sterile formulas and dogmas. The IBT proudly stakes its claim on all that is sterile, reactionary, and counter to Leninism and the historic Spartacism's distortion of permanent revolution. Then there is our own, orientated by the fight to advance class struggle through the struggle against imperialism. Both groups proclaim the need for revolution, but unlike the IBT, we actually forge a path to put those words into action. In this presentation, I will demonstrate what a fight for revolutionary leadership actually entails and why the IBT fails to wage a fight 
and is in fact a roadblock to the struggle in general, but especially in the neo-colonies. Today, the imperialist hegemony of the US is in decline. The American empire has responded hysterically by holding ever tighter to their position and eyeing any potential threats from Russia and Ukraine to China through the AUKUS military pact. In part, motivated by weakened US hegemony and a reaction to years of brutal siege on the Palestinians, Hamas attempted to draw neighboring states into war. Another crack in the US-led order, the reaction has been the holding on ever tighter to their Zionist enclave in the Middle East as it rolls through and bombs Gaza. The US is looking to drag the workers of the world down with it in a spiral of war and destruction. And the world over, the workers' movement has been completely tied to this cause by its bourgeois misleaders. In this decline, the U.S. is squeezing its allies and clients. Nowhere is this more acutely felt than in the neo-colonies. These countries have been defined by imperialist oppression, which has plunged the working class into the depths of misery. Austerity is dictated through imperialist debts. The backwardsness of pre-capitalist relations that denied peasants land and bread are maintained and reinforced by foreign domination. Under globalized imperialist hegemony, the massively growing for growing proletariat of the neo-colonies are kept super exploited and in a stagnating social position. It is here that the workers and toilers yearn to modernize and resist the deplorable conditions enforced by the imperialists, giving an explosive dynamic to the struggle for the most basic demands and propelling the working class to its feet. This felt sense of imperialist oppression has thus far been channeled into support to bourgeois nationalists from Anlo in Mexico to Modi in India who claim they represent the interests of the nation imposed as a progressive or modernizing force in developing the country, capable of uplifting the masses from the conditions enforced by imperialism. There are the represented, they are the representatives of the national bourgeoisie of the neo-colonial countries, what Trotsky described as a semi-ruling, semi-oppressed class, veering between foreign finance capital and the national proletariat. As a property class, they are perennially in fear of the independent mobilization of the proletariat, the only class with the capacity to fight and ultimately defeat imperialism. For all their ret rhetoric about defending the nation, under their leadership, there is neither national nor social emancipation. AMLO, Modi, Lula, etc. only offer dead ends for the working class and offers no solution to escape the trajectory of misery and imperialist carnage. The question is, what way forwards? Over the past decades, there have been two reactions on the left to the seemingly unbreakable grip that the bourgeois nationalists have over the neo-colonial masses, both of which surrender the fight for proletarian leadership. On one hand, there are those who tail the bourgeois nationalists as a progressive force, openly repudiating the necessity of independent revolutionary leadership, or at least postponing it to an indefinite future. A classic example were the Pavlovites, who saw the nationalists not as an obstacle but as a blunt instrument against imperialism. There are countless contemporary iterations of these politics today, each of which cheer on or play left critic advisors to bourgeois nationalism as it leads to the working class, leads the working class into betrayal after betrayal and defeat after defeat. One example is how much the left cynically fawns over Hamas, promoting the movement under their leadership as the path to Palestinian liberation. Against such flagrant opportunism, there are those in the name of proletarian leadership, drew sterile and rigid lines against the national liberation struggle, juxtaposing national liberation with socialism. In this camp stood the old ICL and stands the current IBT, who often denounced the struggle for national liberation as bourgeois in itself, or otherwise a barrier to class struggle. Under this schema, national liberation is not something to champion, but to remove off the agenda but this only leaves the national liberation struggle firmly in the hands of the bourgeois nationalists. The former amounts to competing with the national bourgeois by matching it with nationalist sloganeering, that is, to tail and cheer them on. The latter denounces the struggle to compete at all. Both are a roadblock. What is really necessary is to fight for communist leadership of the anti-imperialist struggle. This is the core of permanent revolution and its strengths. As the Comintern's thesis on the Eastern question outlined in 1922, our duty is to demonstrate that even the smallest day-to-day -day struggles of the working class must be directed at imperialism to permit any real victories. Even in the struggle against the 
for the most basic democratic task, we must fight to guide the workers to the question of class power. At every step, we must expose these nationalists and their program of conciliation to the imperialists as incapable of achieving even their own limited demands, let alone broader democratic and national tasks necessary to achieve national emancipation. Our task is to push forwards, push forwards the struggle against the imperialists, to counterpose our strategy of independent action of the working class against the ones of the national bourgeoisie, and show that in fact they constitute constitute the main political roadblock to a victorious struggle against imperialism. In fact, by advancing each struggle against the imperialists, by bringing the masses to their feet, we do not push the working class closer to the na national bourgeoisie, but deepen the polarization between the two classes. As the struggle against imperialism is pushed to its limits, torn asunder is the nationalist lie of a common interest between the two classes against imperialism. Only through this can we destroy the nationalist illusions that have a stranglehold over the masses. This cannot be done through endless pontification of Marxist sounding formulas, and by, but by actively participating in the anti-imperialist struggle and fighting for a communist program within it and for communist hegemony over it. Only through actively intervening and championing the movement for democracy and national independence against Im imperialism can a proletariat take leadership and come to power the only thing that can ensure resolution of these fundamental questions. This is what it means to fight for revolutionary leadership of the working class of the neo-colonies, not as what the ICL has done previously and the IBT does today, abstractly juxtaposing the dictatorship of the proletariat against the real daily needs and aspiration of the masses. As Trotsky said in reference to Mexico, quote, the fourth international recognizes all the dem democratic tasks of the state in the fight for national independence. But the Mexican section of the fourth international is in competition with the national bourgeoisie, before the workers, before the peasants. We are in permanent competition with the national bourgeoisie as the only one leadership which is capable of assuring victory of the masses in the fight against the foreign imperialists. In the agrarian question, we support expropriations. That does not signify, of course, that we support the national bourgeoisie. In every case, where it is a direct fight against the foreign imperialists or their reactionary fascist agent, we give revolutionary support, preserving the full political independence of our organization, of our program, of our party, and the full freedom of our criticism." Unquote. In response to this, in response to this Trotsky quote, the IBT will say they agree with him that they too, too would have supported the expropriation of the imperialist assets. In doing so, what they miss is the forest for the trees. That is, they miss that Trotsky's method centers the fight for revolutionary leadership in the anti-imperialist struggle. Of course we support the expropriation of imperialist assets, but this narrow view of viewing whether something is supportable or not misses the basis of Trotsky's support. The very thing that it is trying to accomplish, fighting to show how that communists are the best and most consistent fighters against foreign imperialists is something the IBT denounces us for. For the IBT and the old ICL, Marxism is not a guide to action, but little more than a grab bag of formulas to wave at the end of articles to ward off opportunism. The struggles and works of Lenin and Trotsky held all the lessons of the Russian Revolution as codified in the first four congresses of the Comintern are not so much distilled but sterilized into abstract principles to use at any occasion. Such cross-reference Marxism teaches you not how to navigate the waters of class struggle, but to stay on land to avoid drowning. It is no surprise when we actually laid out a program for revolutionary leadership in the neo-colonies in Sparta 68 against our old sterility. The IBT has only been able to cry out, opportunism. At best, they declared that we have crossed some imagined line of opportunism. At worst, they distort our position beyond recognition. Not once do they motivate how their own program advances the fight for revolutionary leadership and ours does not. To be fair, I wouldn't know how to argue on this basis against the ICL's program either. In their article, Spartacism Junk, to argue that we are now orientating to bourgeois nationalism, they pull up a quote from us criticizing our old position as opposition to quote, bourgeois nationalism in oppressed nations based on sectarian class purity, unquote. With such a statement, they seemingly imply that we now support bourgeois nationalism. But what they neglect to quote is the second half of the sentence, which says that the old ICL method, quote, opposes bourgeois nationalism 
in oppressed nations based on sectarian class purity instead of seeking to break its hold on the masses by showing how it is an obstacle to both social and national liberation. In fact, the full quote is a pretty apt summary of the difference between the ICL and IBT, two fundamentally opposed methods to break the hold of bourgeois nationalism, only one which is actually capable of doing so. The, actually, the actual basis of their opposition to our struggle is really reflected in their repeated assertion that we champion the national liberation struggle instead of class struggle as the fundamental level of revolution in the neo-colonies. Their method of reaching this conclusion is simple. Trotsky says we need a dictatorship of the proletariat to overthrow the imperialist yoke in the neo-colonies. Thus, what is needed in is revolution. Revolution can only be achieved through class struggle. Thus, we need to preach for class struggle and revolution to criticize the nationalist leadership not on the basis of their ability to actually wage the struggle, but on the basis that they are not revolutionary and aren't for class struggle. Such methods are very easy for those who would not like to think. But can we be real? People who support AMLO and Modi already know they aren't revolutionaries. Such an argument convinces them of nothing other than the fact that these would-be Marxists have nothing to offer the national liberation movement of today. What are the implications of juxtaposing class struggle and national liberation? The world today is defined by a handful of imperialist countries dividing up and dominating the rest of the world through the export of finance capital. In Lenin's words, our current epoch is defined by imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism. To think that in this situation, the anti-imperialist struggle is not key to liberation, that the struggle against imperialism is in any way separated from the struggle against capitalism, is to renounce the Leninist understanding of capitalism altogether. The difference between ourselves and IBT is not that we see class struggle or the struggle against capitalism as subordinate to a struggle against imperialism. Our difference is that the IBT puts one against the other. The IBT treats the goal of a national emancipation not as intimately connected with social emancipation, but as a diversion from class struggle, something to strike off the agenda to focus on some pure class struggle untainted by the pesky reality of imperialist oppression. Or, as is said in IBT's favorite old Spartacus article, the 1977 thesis on Ireland, quote, we support the right of self-determination and national liberation struggles in order to remove the national question from the historic agenda, not to create another such question, unquote. That is bankruptcy to the highest degree, as Lenin argued against those who dismissed the struggle against the British in the Easter Rebellion in 1916. Quote, to imagine that social revolution is conceivable without revolts by small nations in the colonies and in Europe, without revolutionary outbursts by a section of the petty bourgeoisie, with all its prejudices, without a movement of the politically non-conscious proletarian and semi-proletarian masses against oppression by the landowners, the church, the monarchy, against national oppression, etc. To imagine all this is to repudiate social revolution. So one army lines up in place and says, we are for socialism. And another, somewhere else says, we are for imperialism. And that will be a social revolution. Only who, those who hold such ridiculous pedantic views could vilify the Irish rebellion, unquote. There lies our difference. In place of an actual argument, the Aspartacism junk article can only call out and decry us as Pabloites. Our crime, fighting for national liberation as key to revolution in the neo-colonies. The Fourth International was liquidated by the rise of Pabloism because it was a political tendency which represented, at its core, an open repudiation of the necessity for revolutionary leadership. But the IBT transforms the whole struggle against Pabloism into a caricature. For them, the fundamental problem with Pabloism is that it championed national liberation. For the doctrinaire, repudiating the fight for revolutionary leadership is a secondary question. The IBT's decrying of, our, of the of our defense of the anti-imperialist united front is premised on the same distortion of Leninism. In the fight for revolutionary leadership against imperialism, we must seek to find every avenue to expose the bourgeois nationalists for their betrayals. That includes united fronts. To paraphrase Trotsky, it is necessary to reach episodic agreements with the bourgeoisie, bourgeois nationalists within the framework of strictly defined practical tasks while maintaining complete political independence. This is perhaps not the case for the IBT, but communists used the United Front not just to cohere broader forces, but for a common purpose, uh, for a common purpose in itself, but also for communist hegemony within this United Front. 
This does not mean we are entering permanent blocks with the national bourgeoisie, as the IBT implies. Even the IBT seemingly understands the necessity of this in certain situations. After all, do they not take a military side with Hamas against Israel? Again, for the IPT, they see capitulation and opportunism not in the failure to fight for revolutionary leadership, but in crossing of imagined principles. To accomplish this, they resort to distorting the fourth Congress of the Comintern, which this call derives from. The ICL's position on the anti-imperialist united front and the anti-imperialist struggle as a whole was not invented by us. Our framework on the anti-imperialist struggle is based on the second and fourth Congresses of the Comintern. I asked the IBT, do you stand on the second and fourth Congresses, or do you denounce it just like the old ICL did? In criticizing what they call our junking or spartacism, the IBT declares that we have thrown the baby out in the bathwater. In their words, quote, the SL was distinguished from the Pabloites on a range of important political questions, from Northern Ireland to Israel-Palestine, from the Iranian Revolution to the Malvinas Falklands War, from Mexico to Quebec and Belong. All of that has now been erased. From Mexico to Palestine, the IBT cries we have dropped everything Spartacist. But really, we have only junked the junk, which the IBT still desperately clings on to. Take a look to Mexico, for instance, a country whose entire history is defined by imperialist bondage and devastation. The NAFTA trade agreement opened today's era of unrestricted pillaging. The IMF imposes the harshest austerity me measures on Mexico for the interests of U.S. imperialism. U.S. companies are the direct employers of most of the workers. Imperialism dictates every single political and economic aspect of Mexico. And the whole struggle of the Mexican people has been resistant to such imperialist oppression. In response to this, the ICL argued in 2000, quote, We Spartacists insist that in Mexico, the main enemy is at home. It is the Mexican bourgeoisie, lackey of imperialism, unquote. We insisted that the main enemy is not imperialism in Mexico. This is a reiteration of earlier articles that the IBT upholds today, such as the 1972's Not Green Against Orange by Class Against Class, which declares, quote, the main battle of workers in one nation must always be, be against their own bourgeoisie, unquote. So the main enemy isn't the one actually calling the shots, but the national bourgeoisie, a class which in reality is at best a local branch manager and ministering imperialist dictates. We later repudiated, repudiated the main enemy is at home slogan in Mexico, but still approached each question from some pure class struggle against the Mexican bourgeoisie, not by using the struggle against imperialism to expose its national lackeys. This is what him, Mexican section of the ICL, repudiated. Today, we actually have a program to expose the bourgeois nationalists as nothing but an obstacle to national liberation. So what does the IBT oppose? That we say the main enemy is imperialism? That we say that the struggle against imperialism is key to liberation? That we criticize the nationalists for betraying the struggle against imperialism? This is not isolated to Mexico, of course, but look around at Asia and the Pacific. How the hell are you gonna win any workers from Indonesia, Kanaki, Papua New Guinea, if you argue that the main enemy is not imperialism, but in fact that in the new colonies, the main enemy is at home? or argue that the struggle against imperialism is not central to their liberation. The IBT's position amounts to arguing from the heights of Wellington that the struggle to liberate the nation from imperialism, the root oppression in the neo colonies, is nothing but a distraction. Nowhere is the IBT's method more obviously bankrupt than in Israel slash Palestine. Today, there is an ongoing genocide against Palestinians in Gaza. In response, their recent Stop the Gaza Genocide article reiterates IBT support to the old ICL interpenetrated people's theory, a theory which amounts to little more than a justification to not have a side with the oppressed nation against the oppressor and deny permanent revolution in the region. This theory argues that championing Palestinian liberation could only come at the expense of the democratic rights of the Israeli Jewish nation, which would necessarily entail reversing the terms of oppression and outright national annihilation of the Jewish people. In instead, the IBT calls for class struggle and revolution. But how are you gonna have either if you don't champion the fight for Palestinian liberation? The only basis that you can break Israeli workers from Zionism and win over the Palestinian masses. The IBT goes on further to lament how we have renounced this theory in favor of our current position, which they quote us saying how, quote, the struggle for national liberation is not an obstacle to be moved aside, but a motor force for revolution. 
as long as communists take leadership of the national li liberation struggle, unquote. Actually, this quote is right on the money. The ICL looks to treat the struggle of, for Palestinian liberation not as a distraction, but as a key part of socialist revolution in the region. And what is necessary is that is for that is communist leadership of this national liberation struggle. So what about this quote does the IBT have a problem with? Does the IBT renounce that communists must fight for leadership of the national liberation struggle? Does the IBT see the struggle for Palestinian liberation nothing more than an obstacle to be moved aside? For the IBT, is the Palestinians' resistance to their national extermination a mere distraction? Exemplifying this bankruptcy is the affirmation of the slogan, not Jew against Arab, but class against class, aka, don't get distracted with the fight to free Palestine. Focus on some pure class struggle instead. Soon after October 7th, the IBT re released a leaflet down with the Zionist terror, which argued, quote, the apartheid regime run by Tel Aviv is the inevitable result of the Zionist project to establish an ethno-religious state for Jews. Some 75 years ago, this led to the violent expulsion of about 750,000 Palestinians and the confiscation of over 90% of the land. The current attack on Gaza is a direct continuation of that unfinished campaign of ethnic cleansing, unquote. Yes, correct. The Zionist state, established and codified in the 1948 war, was premised on the expulsion of the Palestinians. It is a settler colonial project predicated on the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinian people of which the genocide in Gaza is a continuation of. So where did the Spartacist tradition lie on the question? Well, the original position on the 1948 war, a position the SL took in 1968, was that there was a side to take in the war with Israel. This was the war that led to the expulsion of entire cities of Palestinians and the establishment of the Zionist state within the green lines. And we justified it under the line lie that the Israeli Jewish nation was threatened with extinction. The same 1968 article also called for a peace treaty on the 1949 boundary lines and equated the Zionist state with the Israeli Jewish nation. In a later 1974 article, Birth of a Zionist State, which the IBT actively promotes today, the old SL changed their position to a dual defeatist one, arguing not that this was a bankrupt capitulation to Zionism, but that new facts were discovered that indicated the Jewish nation was not threatened. Since then, the old ICL had maintained, as the IBT does today, that the borders that came from the 1948 war constitute a core part of Israel that must be defended if threatened. That is to say, the IBT still defends the settler colonial conquest of the 1948 war as legitimate, which is the same line of the liberal Zionists. This updated defeatist line on the 1948 war, while less egregious, is still a gross capitulation to Zionism and imperialism. By having such a position, the IBT puts an equal sign between the Zionists who are looking to expropriate Palestine and the Arab nations that were fighting against it. Yes, it is true that Arab leaders will only betray the struggle for Palestinian freedom, but the task of communists was to intervene in the struggle against Zionism and show how these corrupt regimes only undermine the fight for free Palestine, including by fomenting anti-Jewish reaction, which only rallied the Jewish workers to the Zionist cause. Instead of this, the IBT, like the historic SL, called to point the guns the other way in a conflict which was in the IBT's own words, a quote, violent expulsion of about 750,000 Palestinians and the confiscation of over 90% of their land, unquote, which the current genocide in Gaza is a continuation of. I asked to the IBT, which side are you on in the Nakba? This is not a historical question, of course, but has its implications in ongoing war today. In contrast to the IBT's approach of treating Palestinian liberation as a mere distraction, the ICL produced an article, A Revolutionary Road for Palestinian Liberation, which puts front and center the question of national liberation. The entire basis of our intervention is centered around putting forward a strategy to defend Gaza, smash the Zionist state, and defeat imperialism. We motivate the necessity of joint Jewish-Palestinian struggle not through moral preaching to love one's neighbor and focus on class struggle, but by putting forward a counter post st strategy to free Palestine and demonstrate that communists are the best fighters of Palestinian liberation, and that under Hamas, there is only death and defeat. Only by centering the question of Palestinian liberation are we able to motivate Hamas's of how Hamas's approach of looking for mates with the bourgeois, bourgeois nationalist rulers while lumping Jewish workers with the Zionist state is in fact completely counterproductive to the struggle to liberate Palestine. That in fact, 
To destroy the Zionist state, what needs to happen is to break it along class lines, which can only happen if Jewish workers can be warned to the struggle for Palestinian freedom as their own. At the same time, we must convince Palestinians of the necessity of joint struggle and to defend the national rights of Jewish workers to live in Palestine, whose liberation also demands the smashing of the Zionist state. Above all, it emphasizes that joint class struggle in both Palestine and Israel quote, must be connected to breaking the main obstacle standing in the way of any social progress, Israel's oppression of Palestinians, unquote, which is the fundamentally fundamental central question of the conflict. For the IBT, in their Stop the Gaza Genocide article, they clearly have a lot to complain about the ICL. To try and respond to our article, they repeat their distortions on, on the anti-imperialist United Front to imply we see no reason to expose the bourgeois nationalists and that revolutionary leadership objectively springs from such tactics automatically. They lament how we center the, the question of national liberation in Palestine. What do they put forward in this place? Class struggle, as if class struggle is abstracted from the struggle for national liberation of Palestine. This long and turgid article reads more like a wish list for joint class struggle and revolution, rather than actually counterposing a strategy to Hamas. And when they finally do try to motivate how to break Palestinian workers from Hamas, it is almost comical. Quote, thus Palestinian communists will not simply block militarily with Hamas, but also advance transitional economic demands. For example, during the protests against Hamas's social austerity in July 2023, unquote. Gaza is being turned to rubble. There's an active genocide that threatens to destroy the Palestinian nation. Palestinians are not supporting Hamas because they, they, they think they have the best social welfare schemes. Palestinians are supporting Hamas because they think Hamas are the best fighters against Zionism and imperialism, because they believe Hamas is the best bet to free Palestine from the river to the sea. To imagine that the Palestinian people will break from Hamas because you are critical of their austerity reforms is not only economist, but pathetic. The ICL puts front and center the struggle for communist leadership with, an act, with a program to expose Hamas for betraying the national liberation struggle. The IBT renounces this fight and in place offers budget critiques. This is the fruit of separating class struggle against the struggle for Palestinian liberation. In imperialist countries where the IBT does almost all of their work, it is clear they are not looking to fight for communist leadership or the Palestinian movement either. In fact, the speeches they have published on their website are pretty openly laudatory of the element of the pro-imperialist union bureaucracy, praising what they call honorable unions who advance collective actions for Palestine, which in their May Day article, they make pretty explicit include those friends of Palestine bureaucrats in Australia. In truth, these friends of Palestine most notably the, in the CFMEU and MUA, are the main political roadblock to any real workers' action for Palestine in this country, and has consistently opposed strike action and black bans due to their block with the open supporters of genocide and government. The SLA's work in the recent period has been primarily to expose the treacherous role of these bureaucrats. Meanwhile, the IBT plays their left cover. In imperialist countries too, they betray the struggle for national liberation of the neocolonies. I would like to end the presentation by quoting the pieces on the Eastern question. Quote, any refusal of communists in the colonies to take part in the struggle against imperialist tyranny on the excuse of supposed defense of independent class interests is opportunism of the worst sort that can only discredit proletarian revolution in the East, unquote. This is not only true when there is a military side in the case of a war, but in peacetime as well. After all, war is politics by other means. This is the road the ICL has rejected, and this is the road the IBT is currently on. Thank you. Thank you, and now the first speaker from the IBT for 30 minutes. My name is Bill Logan. Thank you, thank you for this debate. Clarification of political ideas through argument is important. The new Spartacists believe their forebearers were sectarian and fundamentally wrong about permanent revolution. They were a bottomless pit of confusion and sterility, apparently. They claim to have transcended this centrist mess during a brief moment of enlightenment after the death of James Robertson while in a bout of paralysis during the COVID crisis. Now, of course, 
the early Spartacists had flaws, but they continued the program and organizational methods of the Fourth International, uh, methods qualitatively sufficient to lead a revolution. The pre-Spartacists emerged as a tendency in the United States while politics was starting to revive after the relative stagnation of the McCarthy period. What was distinctive about the revolutionary tendency in the Spartacists was that they did not pretend that the growing struggles had any inbuilt tendency to become revolutionary. They saw the necessity to intervene with a program to transform the struggles, the transitional program, which draws the class line, builds consciousness of the class as a class, and mobilizes the class to fight uh, in its own interests, transforming the struggles around today's non-revolutionary consciousness and activity into revolutionary consciousness and activity. As we in this room know, in the early 1950s, Michel Pablo infected our movement with the illusion that the working class could take power without the intervention of a revolutionary vanguard. Originally, Pablo saw the Moscow line Stalinists struggle as having an inbuilt impetus toward proletarian revolution. But over time, different fragments of world Trotskyism focused on other movements and imagined sources of self-generated uh, revolutionary consciousness and action. Trade unionism, various nationalisms, social democratic reformism, Castroism, Maoism, the movement against the Vietnam War, feminism, and so on. The method was the same. Seek to join the movement, seek to build the movement, seek influence in the movement, try to take a prominent place. But the fight for revolutionary program was forgotten. As we know, the Spartacists were built in the struggle against this kind of Pabloism. Back in those days, we fought against imperialist domination or black oppression or Maori oppression. Without becoming nationalists and without pandering to the illusions uh, in the national struggle that it could turn itself into a proletarian revolutionary struggle, we fought against the Vietnam War without either capitulating to the Vietnamese Stalinists or becoming implicated in the bourgeois pacifist campaign to put the movement uh, behind the anti-war wing of the imperial bourgeoisie. We joined every struggle against oppression, but we didn't accept the non-revolutionary politics of the struggle. We fought against the boss, but opposed reformism. We fought for women's liberation, but we opposed feminism. We knew how to draw the class line. That lies at the core of Bolshevism. At the most fundamental level, Marxism is about engendering class consciousness and organizing the working class as a class against the bourgeoisie. When a reformist party standing in parliamentary elections in its incomplete and approximate way uh, claims to represent the working class against the parties of the bourgeoisie, then critical support and voting for such a party may be a tool to engender class consciousness. But when a party which makes no attempt to represent the working class as a class, a party like the Democrats in the United States or the economic freedom fighters in South Africa, then that party is fundamentally bourgeois. And critical support or a vote in no way leads in the direction of class consciousness. And when a party stands for election pretending to represent the working class, but in alliance with an openly bourgeois party, a liberal party, for example, there is no way that a vote for it draws the class line. And there's no excuse for critical support. As the record shows, such alliances are used to disarm the working class and prepare the way for right-wing repression. When Salvador Allende stood as the popular unity candidate for the Chilean elections in 1970, everyone else on the left supported him. Would our new Spartacists have supported him too? The old Spartacists 
It argued that Allende's win would end in disaster. Is that part of the sectarian abstentionism you charge your forebearers with? There was nothing abstentionist about our work on Chile. We joined the demonstrations. We called for the political independence of the working class. We opposed Allende's instructions, the class, uh, to hand in its weapons and to appease his bourgeois allies. We raised revolutionary demands. We knew how to combine political opposition to the popular unity government with calls to defend it militarily against the rising, uh, rising threat of takeover by the army. In the event, as you know, the government was liquidated. The organizations of the working class were destroyed. Thousands were killed, and the most conscious elements of the Chilean working class were forced into exile. We helped them escape, and we made some important friends politically. It was in 1971 that the Spartacist tendency really took off. Social struggle was elevated and talk of intermittent, of imminent revolution was, were rife. We expanded our capacity with some key regroupments and under the influence of extraordinary optimism and stirring rhetoric about being halfway up the greasy pole, the membership was raised to new levels of sacrifice and dedication. If only uh, revolutionary optimism at that point had been tempered a little. Nevertheless, the Spartacists built a highly successful fighting propaganda group, especially in America, with a fortnightly newspaper, implantation of fractions in carefully selected workplaces, extraordinary uh, work among women, a highly professional legal defense arm, uh, and an active, intelligent youth movement. There were also international breakthroughs. In Britain, uh, the breakthrough in building Spartacism involved opposition to Pablo, the Pablism of Alan Thornett's Workers' Socialist League, particularly on the question of trade union work and Ireland. We intervened to show how you could join the trade union struggle with a program which made the transition to revolutionary politics and how you could stand against the British occupation without capitulating to Irish nationalism. So this was a time of great promise. But then something happened, something bigger than the Spartacist tendency. Class struggle and leftist activity, particularly in the United States, stalled and reversed. Optimism collapsed. Revolution no longer felt imminent. This had profound effects on us. The fish started to rot, and as usual, it rotted from the head down. 1978, is a key year. It was a year of many changes, which together had a huge impact. Not yet on the program, but on the organization, on the guardrails of democratic centralism, which maintain a program. At the beginning of that year, Liz Gordon, the most authoritative uh, woman in the tendency, was degraded and humiliated in, that, in an editorial dispute about an article on Roman Polanski. Liz's argument was in fact sensible, but even if she'd been wrong, trashing her so demeaningly hung a sword of Damocles over the head of every senior member of the organization. With the downturn in struggle was a downturn in hiring with a direct financial impact. The fortnightly workers vanguard had to go monthly. This hit the organization hard. The, develop, the, the headquarters moved from rented space to a building purchased in Lower Man Manhattan. And there was a big shuffling around of personnel to refurbish and maintain the building. That was 1978 too. This was also a year we won 24 members of the Workers' Socialist League, including comrades with deep roots in the British and Irish left. Considerable experience and huge talent. It was a fusion which signaled great promise, but also upset the evolved political and organizational balance of the international tendency. Only a few months later, the international leadership intervened to remove the elected leadership of the new British section and install its own nominees. So much for international democratic centralism. 
few weeks later, the uh, leadership did a similar thing in the youth organization in the United States, re 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 reconstituting its elected leadership in what was called the cloned youth fight. So much for the principles of youth party relations. All in all, the Spartans' tendency was a very different creature at the end of 1978 than it had been at the beginning. But these were only changes in the mechanisms of corrective discussion of our program. The actual programmatic consequences were a little delayed. Within three years, however, the international leadership were denouncing and driving out members in Germany who had the temerity to oppose a motion to, quote, take responsibility in advance for whatever idiocies and atrocities the Polish Stalinists may commit against Solidarnosc. And by 1983, the Spartacists were advising their American imperialist masters to avoid losing troops in Lebanon. Soon, they were doing their very best to trash an extraordinarily valuable anti-apartheid boycott uh, of South African cargo in the Bay Area waterfront, simply because it was led by a member of the external tendency, the forerunner of the IBT. And they liquidated their own painstakingly built and sometimes highly effective trade union fractions. Increasingly, there was an erratic and nasty element to Spartacus' politics with wild accusations of police collaboration and so on hurled at leftist political opponents. By the mid-1980s, uh, it had become a mere remnant. The Spartacists were incapable of addressing the impending collapse of the Soviet bloc. There are some wonderful myths about Spartacus' heroics around the fall of Stalinism, but the truth is sad. In the German Democratic Republic during the first two months of 1990, the ICL fooled themselves that they were playing a significant role in a political revolution. In fact, there was no political revolution. That was a delusion, and the working class was becoming increasingly demoralized, the Spartacists were playing no role whatever. In the elections, which drew this period to a close, the Spartacists got fewer votes than the German beer drinking party. And with the counter-revolution in the Soviet Union, which followed in August 1991, the ICL were even more disoriented and simply didn't recognize the critical moments, adopting a position of effective neutrality and then denial of reality. I think we here are all agreed that the fall of the Soviet Union was the most serious defeat ever built, dealt to the working class, leading to a precipitous decline in class struggle. We presumably also agree that we are now in a period of revival of class struggle with new possibilities for revolutionary intervention. The neo-Spartacist reaction to this revival is frankly banal. They say we should take the lead in developing struggles. Now, of course we should. Every political tendency seeks to take a lead in the social struggles of the day. The question is, on what program do we seek to lead the struggles of the day? But, but it doesn't actually tell you what to do except join the, join the um, leadership, try to lead it. How can we, the point is to introduce a program. How can we lead simply by waving a thing which actually doesn't suit say anything, <laughs> except you should join and lead. The point is, we don't have any new, we don't have any new things to say. But the answers you claim and you are terribly familiar to us. The tired old answers of Pablo'ism and its offshoots. 
But there are answers to all these questions. These answers are in the transitional program. And you hardly mention the transitional program. It's apparently a bit old hat. I've been told that the transitional program is a bit old hat all my life. But it's terribly disappointing to see the Spartacist League treating it that way. You got court team notes. This goes by. You can take time from your closing statements as well. Go on. The team. Ah. What's the. <coughs> Hello, my name is Vera Ashbourne. Trotskyism as a current was founded on the understanding. Sorry? The understanding. I the mean, international... the seconds, the both speakers, both speakers are from the IBT. Answer. Thank you. Trotskyism as a current was founded on the understanding, one from bitter experience, that the colonial bourgeoisie cannot carry out the revolution against imperialism. While they may oppose imperialism temporarily to advance their own position, they will betray the national struggle every time. As Trotsky wrote in History of the Russian Revolution, this bourgeoisie of backward countries from the days of its milk teeth grows up as agentry of foreign capital, and notwithstanding its envious hatred of foreign capital, always does and always will in every decisive situation turn up in the same camp with it. This is the core truth of permanent revolution written in the blood of workers from China to Spain. The fight for national revolution thus rests on the workers' shoulders. They must win the peasant masses to a revolutionary program fusing democratic and socialist tasks and wrest leadership of the national struggle from the bourgeoisie. Per the transitional program, democratic slogans, transitional demands, and the problems of the socialist revolution are not divided into separate historical epochs in the struggle but stem directly from one another. On the basis of the revolutionary democratic program, it is necessary to oppose the workers to the national bourgeoisie. Accordingly, the Fourth International saw political independence of, from the, of the proletarian party from the bourgeoisie as vital. My comrade Bill spoke about the corrosive effects of Pabloism on this revolutionary line. The Pabloists turned permanent revolution on its head they claimed the objective necessity of socialist measures to the revolution would impel petty bourgeois leaders to adopt a socialist program at the critical hour. The early Spartacists defined themselves through fierce opposition to this inverted Trotskyism. In Chile 1970, they alone refused support to the Allende government. In Iran 1979, they alone refused support to the mullahs who butchered the Iranian revolution. They did groundbreaking work towards a revolutionary program for the interpenetrated peoples of Northern Ireland, Cyprus, and Palestine. It is this work that we are defending today. This is not to say we defend the whole history and positions of Spartacism. Bill discussed the IST's degeneration, and your recent writing has hit on some of its resulting errors. We'd agree, for instance, that the line you adopted on Puerto Rico in the, in the 1990s was chauvinist, and that it was thoroughly mistaken to say calls for constituent assemblies are wrong under any circumstances. One critical error relevant to this, to this discussion concerns the 1983 bombing of a US Marine barracks in Lebanon, which killed roughly 300 American and French soldiers. In response, the IST shamefully called for Marines out of Lebanon, now alive. Alive? We're certainly for imperialist troops out of anywhere, but we don't ask for mercy from their victims while kicking them out. So when you called for, I quote, sparing the precious blood of US Marines, we termed this a social patriotic flinch, a sign of deeper rot in the IST. Your response was to call us bloodthirsty and claim there was no just anti-imperialist side in Lebanon. But the just side against imperialist occupation is whoever is fighting it, regardless of their other political practice. As far as I know, the ICL has not repudiated Marines out of Lebanon now alive, and nor has the internationalist group whose leader Jan Norden was editor of Workers' Vanguard when it was written. 
do you still hold this rotten position? In rejecting interpenetrated people's theory, Spartacist 68 states, the task of communists is not to counterpose the struggle for national liberation to the struggle for socialism, but to fuse them. We agree, that's what the theory does. When two, when two nations are vying for self-determination on the same territory, one people's self-determination within the framework of a bourgeois nation state is possible only through oppressing the other. We defend whatever nation is oppressed at the moment from attacks by the other, but Marxists can't simply support their bourgeoisie's nationalism as resolving the question. Instead, workers of both nations must unite against both national bourgeoisies, resolving each nation's democratic tasks by transforming their conflicting national struggles into conjoined socialist revolution. This is not abstention or neutrality, but consistent permanent revolution. Against this, Spartacus 68 has slander. You disavowed the theses on Ireland based on a handful of lines gloomy about homegrown revolution in Northern Ireland, ignoring that the entire document is a program for just that revolution. This is deeply unserious. On whether the IST claimed revolution in Palestine is most likely impossible until there is a revolution in a neighboring country. I can't speak to whatever you've written since the 80s, but the key documents from its revolutionary period make no such claim. And you entirely ignore Cyprus, the third early example of interpenetrated peoples, perhaps because the conflict there ended in a reversal of the terms of national oppression, a possibility for which your new approach has no revolutionary answer. Your new position is frankly a mess. You claim interpenetrated peoples rejects the need to put national liberation struggle at the center of our revolutionary strategy. But your piece, Only Death and Defeat with Hamas, asserts Palestinian struggle is not the sole central factor in Palestine. Class struggle in Israel is also necessary, and fusing the two is the road for both peoples. So are Palestinian and Israeli workers to overcome their national conflict by making it a joint class struggle? Well, that's interpenetrated peoples, which we've now learned is wrong. Um, the anti-imperialist united front you now espouse instead implies alliance with bourgeois nationalists. But your article condemns support to Hamas, even under direct Zionist attack. It's right to reject political support to Hamas, and we oppose attacks on civilians, of course. But Trotsky endorsed military support even to fascists against imperialist forces. You've somehow achieved neither class independence nor unconditional military support against imperialism. This isn't Trotskyism, it's nonsense. Your line on Iran also makes no sense and veers into Pabloism. It is indeed true the mullahs were a reactionary answer to the imperialist pillage of Iran that the Pahlavi monarchy facilitated, but that in no way implies any struggle against the Shah was automatically progressive on that basis alone. You agree the mullahs were reactionary, but you seem to think this has no bearing on the movement behind them. You reproach us for denying this movement with that leadership was progressive, your only evidence being that it opposed the Shah. The Pabloists and Stalinists back then also thought the Islamic revolution was progressive, its leaders an afterthought. The Spartans alone called for workers to organize independently and fight for leadership of the anti-imperialist struggle on a class basis. The tragedy of 1979 is that this was possible. The Iranian workers were organized and militant enough, but their leaders thought a movement uniting worker, merchant, and cleric under slogans like the only party is the party of Allah and death or hijab was progressive. When we cited Hitler as proof that sometimes there are, in fact, reactionary movements against reactionary regimes, your response was worrying that this was too hard on the Ayatollah and might offend his partisans. But you say elsewhere in Spartacus 68, there is no such thing as being too hard on Stalinists. Comrades, do you prefer the Ayatollah to the Stalinists now? For communist leadership of the anti-imperialist struggle rejects the idea that the main enemy of Mexican workers is their own bourgeoisie. The main enemy is now the imperialists. The Mexican bourgeoisie are mere lackey. 
Your refurbished Mexican section likewise says its former incarnation basically took sides with imperialism by rejecting the fact that the whole country, including the national bourgeoisie, is oppressed by the imperialists. But the revolutionary IST's position was not that communists in neo-colonial countries should fight the national bourgeoisie rather than imperialism, but that these fights are usually one and the same. The colonial bourgeoisie's typical relation to imperialism is as agents, not just victims. So in general, the practical task of fighting imperialism in the neo-colonies requires fighting the compradors in some fashion. And while it's true the national bourgeoisie is oppressed by imperialism, assuming some qualitative similarity between that oppression and the oppression of other classes under imperialism is a gateway to burying the class line through building strategic united fronts. This is a common theme in your new works. Take the article Five Guns minutes. for Women, which calls for mass arming of Mexican women to combat misogynist violence. Now, I'm for arming working women, but Guns for Women assumes militancy alone sets this demand apart as communist, not feminist. Not so, comrades. I know radical feminists who take your demand even further and call for a women's guerrilla war. A communist demand would orient the anti-feminist struggle on a class basis through calls like union defense guards for working women or workers and neighborhoods councils to organize transitional housing and support for abuse victims, homeless people, etc. There is no such transitional demand in Guns for Women. No framing of femicide as a class issue at all. Instead, we get an individualist, non-class demand, which the article itself calls inadequate, appended to a call for social revolution with no bridge between the two. It does nothing to turn women's struggle towards class struggle. It is an adaptation to feminism, comrades, not a rebuke. And here is your new turn's essence. Rediscovering Trotskyism means downplaying the class divide on the most pressing questions facing oppressed groups implicitly making class merely one struggle among many. All this finds its logical outcome with Spartacist South Africa's recent critical vote for the bourgeois left nationalist economic freedom fighters. Why? Because they're popular. And as in Mexico, the bourgeois nationalist program represents genuine struggle against the brutal national oppression faced by all black people in South Africa, regardless of class, explicitly encompassing the national bourgeoisie. Sure, you claim the EFF can't implement their program and communists can exploit their vacillations and betrayals, but you're still calling for workers to fight for a bourgeois program rather than raising an independent class position. This is a step backwards even from SSA in 2022, which wrote, the struggle for national liberation will be the strategic motor force for proletarian socialist revolution in this country. The key requirement is the proletariat's complete political independence from bourgeois nationalism. Your old group, even in the twilight of middle Spartacism, was able to maintain a class line. By contrast, your new policy is to seek alliances with black bourgeois or aspirationally bourgeois layers in the struggle for power, popular frontism, in other words. SSA's writings were very useful in understanding your new course. Here, Spartacist 68's vague accusations of sterility, chauvinism, and dismissing nationalism find concrete conclusions. The non-sterile, non-chauvinist method is to block with the nationalists if they appear to have popular support. Thus concretized, we can name the new line for what it is, not rediscovery of permanent revolution, but negation. It is sad to see the organization that once upheld Trotskyism best against Pavlovism turn towards it. Sadder yet to see it treat its past so light-mindedly. You may aspire to wrest leadership of the anti-imperialist struggle away from the nationalists, but in practice you are beginning to tail them. The core truth of permanent revolution is that leadership of the anti-imperialist struggle can only be a working class leadership and that it is carried out by breaking with the bourgeois and petty bourgeois nationalists, not joining them. 
This is the revolutionary leadership today in the title of our debate. We encourage ICL comrades serious about this heritage, comrades not seeking a shortcut to revolution through effectively abandoning permanent revolution and Trotskyism, to reevaluate your recent transformation in light of the IBT's long-standing and comprehensive critique and see that transformation for what it really is. Not an exciting step forward, but the culmination of a process of degeneration that leads into the Pabloist abyss. Thank you. Okay, thank you. You've, you've used up uh, 44 seconds of your closing statement, which we'll count at the end. Um, 44 seconds. Oh, 44 seconds. That's, um, what we might do before we start questions, is it possible to bring that microphone forward to put in the aisle so it's not so far at the back? Um, I'll just remind of the format of the Q&A rounds. We'll be first taking a question from the SL in which they'll have four minutes to ask their question or make their statement and I'll give you a verbal reminder at one minute and then I'll, I'll sort of aggressively cut you off at uh, four minutes. Then we'll do the same, take someone from the IBT who will do, do the same. Some uh, comrades may get chosen to spoke twice, but we want to make sure each round has one person from each side. And then, so we'll go SL, IBT, and then we'll take someone from an organization or an individual. The first up will be the RCO, who will make a statement after the SL and the IBT. So first of all, can I call on someone from the SL? Okay, well, that first part of the IBT's presentation felt like a strange storytelling session without program, in fact, and I agree with you, Bill, that you indeed have nothing new to say. I'd like to, ins so I'd like to insist on a few points that my comrade made regarding what the IBT's positions actually mean in reality. So at a demo against the genocide in Dunedin, New Zealand, your supporter proclaimed, but it is the responsibility of workers all over the world to make a stand, to transcend nationalist divides and recognize that the interests of the workers internationally are more aligned with each other than they are with our own respective ruling classes. This feel-good kumbaya statement is in fact a negation of the distinction between the oppressed and oppressor nation. The Israeli working class will never be broken on this basis. Breaking Israeli workers must be based on showing them why the fight for Palestinian national liberation is in their interest. Why, as Marx said, one nation cannot be free if it oppresses another. The fundamental issue here is the national question. One nation, Israel, oppresses the other, Palestine. It's quite simple, actually. But the historic line of the ICL denied this, and you defend this today. The interpenetrated people's quote theory was concocted to obscure this basic fact. It was premised on conflating the Israeli Jewish nation, whose national rights must be defended, and the Zionist state, which must be smashed. This theory argues that to fight for the national liberation of one in the here and now can only mean fighting for the annihilation of the other people. What do you guys think about from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free? Zionists malign this as anti-Semitic. The historic line of the ICL meant that this slogan could only mean the annihilation of Israeli Jews. You will obviously never win Palestinians to revolution, nor win Israeli workers to revolution on the basis of liberal Zionism, which is what our past line was a capitulation to and all that you have, in fact, offered today. In 1968, the article in Spartacist on the 67 Israeli-Arab War, which I assume you stand on since that wasn't in your list of things that were wrong, was titled, Turn the Guns the Other Way. The article literally said, quote, in 1948, the central issue in dispute was the right of the Hebrew nation to exist. This position of Israeli defensism was argued in contrast to a defeatist line for the 67 war, i.e. it was against the workers' interest to take a side with either. We later changed our line on 48 due to, quote, new facts uh, to a defeatist line, which is also reactionary. Again, you didn't answer my comrade's question. Did workers have a side in the Nakba? Please, do tell. Today, you say the, quote, crucial question at the moment is which side, if any, Marxists take in this conflict, and you are for a purely tactical military bloc with Hamas. Okay, but then later in the same article, you say, Jewish workers, turn your guns around, not Jew against Arab, but class against class. This is purposely confusionist. To tell Jewish workers it's just class against class is to bury the fight for national liberation of Palestine. Well, you know what? Zionism cannot be 
quote, transcended, as you say, like through transcendental meditation or something. It needs to be defeated for the revolutionary struggle in the region to advance. Again, turn the guns around is a defeatist call. It means both sides turn the guns around against their own rulers. So do you have a side or not? What is behind all this confusion you push? It's your refusal to fight for communist leadership of the national liberation struggle. Again, you will not make a revolution in this region if you do not fight for the national liberation of Palestine. So let's be clear. This is the historic crime of our old position that we have junked, and this is the crime that you insist on continuing today. Thank you. Comrade from the IBT. So the following contribution was drafted by L. Brochery, who could not be here today. The ICL has made the anti-imperialist United Front central to its work in the last year. You proclaim it in South Africa, Mexico, and even in Melbourne. You might deny it, but the Trotskyist movement abandoned the slogan in 1927, and it was right to do so. We are for fighting imperialism, which, yes, involves building United Front actions on a strict, limited, practical basis. Trotskyists would fight alongside nationalists for Karnak independence and alongside even Islamist militants in Gaza against the genocidal assault of the IDF. But to proclaim the anti-imperialist United Front as a strategic orientation is wrong. Just like the Stalinist slogan for the Workers' United Front evolved from a tactic of temporary blocks into a permanent alliance with reformists, your line will tend to deform into an alliance with the bourgeois nationalists. You say that because the revolutionary Comintern used the slogan, it is revolutionary today, but Trotsky abandoned it for a reason. The Comintern policy for colonies was guided by the example of the Javan communists, who under the leadership of Snivliet made an ostensibly successful entry into the pan-Islamist Sarakat Islam. The result was that they were purged and left with politically disoriented cadres with deep illusions in the anti-imperialist credentials of pan-Islamism. Read the proceedings of the Fourth Congress, not just Lenin at the Second. Under the name Maring, Snevliet would lead the CCP to enter and build the Guomindang. The immediate practical result of the anti-imperialist United Front slogan was common turn acceptance of similar policies, it accepted the class independence for the imperialist countries, but in the colonies you can't get by without a little bit of class collaboration. Despite Lenin's good words about safeguarding independent class organization at that Congress, this time he let an opportunist deviation go unopposed. Trotsky opposed the Chinese communist entry into the Guomindang, but it was not until the logic of that entry came to fruition under Stalinism. With the massacre of the cadres, by the Guomindang that he publicized his position. And you can check this in the political situation in China and the tasks of the Bolshevik-Leninist opposition. Communists never merge organizationally with alien classes. And we must see that a strategic long-term block is a step toward merging. And class independence did not prevent the Trotskyist movement from fighting on the side of colonized nations. So why resurrect the slogan if not to reintroduce the immediate practical conclusions communists took from it. The entry tactic does not differ, essentially, from the tactic of critical support. One minute. Both are a special form of the United Front tactic, based on a fight to advance the consciousness and power of the working class. We don't build bourgeois forces. We don't trust them to fight imperialism. When they do, we fight alongside them. But even when they make radical noises about a freedom charter, we don't vote for them. In other words, tactical blocks without giving political support is one thing. The anti-imperialist united front is another. And it isn't a lever for revolution. It's a step towards popular frontism. And in China, 1926, Spain, 1937, Indonesia, 1965, Chile, 1973, we know where that leads. Thank you. <clears throat> Comrade from the Revolutionary Communist Organization. We? No, 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 sorry, the Revolutionary Communist Organization. Good Hello? Uh, oh, there we go. 
I'm Anthony from the Revolutionary Communist Organization. I'd like to congratulate both groups on an excellent debate. It was exciting to watch. Um, I'll give an overview and just you know ask a few questions. I think both groups correctly identify the importance of proletarian class independence and you know thus this independence of the socialist movement in these struggles, in social struggles, in struggles against imperialism, what have you. I think both groups also address, in their own way, the importance of clarifying the and finishing the democratic tasks of bourgeois nationals to the very end, carrying out these tasks. This is what the RSDLP and the SBT both laid out in their own respective programs. I think that's an important historical legacy that both groups have, in their own ways, um, represented and continued on. The question for me is, and for the RCO generally, what does communist leadership in national liberation struggles actually look like, concretely? We agree that in the case of Israel, for example, the settler colonial relation within the state or between the states um, acquires an overdetermination of simple class relations. We disavow any attempts to simply unify workers of both nation states or nations and overthrow them in one instantaneous socialist revolution. We disavow attempts to split soldiers from the IDF purely and have a worker revolution immediately off the bat before Palestinian liberation has been essentially addressed. Yet we also agree on the importance, with the RBT that is, on the importance of introducing a program to these national liberation movements, a revolutionary program, one that goes beyond the demands of simple bourgeois national struggle and posits ultimate socialist revolution as a component of this struggle, of this end goal. Um, I mean, in the case of the RCO, we prefer a minimum maximum program to the transitional form. However, this is a point of you know, disagreement and I'd love to talk about it afterwards. Overall, there seems to be a confusion between the two sides here. Does the IBT really actually reject intervention into anti-imperial struggle as the SL has so painted? And does the SL actually believe in a sort of dissolutionist, Pabloist approach to this intervention or to achieving communist leadership as the IBT has painted throughout their debates? I don't think either are true. I think there is, to some extent, more common ground than is expected. But um, I believe this, both sides presented have raised interesting and compelling arguments. So thank you. Cool. Thank you. Um, before we go to the next round, is there anyone else who would like to make a presentation on behalf of an organization? Uh, anyone unaffiliated from individuals? Comrade Keats? Oh, uh, we'll, we'll get to you in the next round. I'm just taking names. So anyone else who would like to make a statement at some point? Yep, I'll take a good one. All right. So next up, we have someone from the SL, please. Uh, my name is Neil. Um, so I think the IBT would have you believe that we've invented some fundamental new revision of Marxism. In fact, the Bolsheviks recognise that the fight for democracy, for land, for freedom of oppressed nations, for the Tsarist Empire, were fundamental levers for the necessary social revolution in Russia. And it was through fighting to expose the bankruptcy of the reformist and liberal uh, strategies of the existing leaderships of these struggles that the Bolsheviks were able to fuse together the oppressed masses of the Tsarist Empire behind the working class in a revolutionary assault on Russian capitalism that was the October Revolution. This is the essence of permanent revolution, recognition of the need for communist leadership of the democratic struggle. In the neo-colonies, uh, that means in the first and, fo first and foremost, uh, national liberation from imperialist oppression. This is what the Revolutionary Communist International posed as the chief task of revolutionaries in the subjugated nations. <coughs> that in denying this, our critics also denounce us for, for defending Lenin before 1917 uh, because we affirm the essential identity between the strategic line of the Bolshevik Party and Trotsky. Look, the idea, apart from the party question, that there was any fundamental difference between the program of Trotsky and Lenin before 1917 is a Stalinist creation. It only makes sense if you treat Lenin's formula for the revolutionary democratic dictatorship of the peasantry and proletariat 
as some sort of dogma rather than what it was, which is a call to action for a revolutionary alliance of workers and peasants against Tsarism and against the liberal bourgeoisies, one that could only culminate in a revolutionary dictatorship. Um, the unfolding of the Russian Revolution showed the limitations of Lenin's prognosis, not that it, not that it was some fundamentally uh, Menshevik program. Now, if permanent revolution is more than, than dogma, then it means the central question posed in the neo-colonial world uh, is how to wield the deeply felt demands for democracy, land, and national liberation to tear the toiling classes from the grip of their national leaderships. Comments have talked about South Africa. There, the most left-wing workers and militant fighters for black freedom look to the black nationalist economic freedom fighters because its demands uh, for the likes of land expropriation and nationalisation of the mines speak to their felt needs for radical change. How to break militants from them and expose the EFF's inability to realise their own demands? Or to put them in power? Um, this, in the recent elections, we said vote EFF, but be warned. Their nationalist and parliamentarist program can only lead to betrayal. One minute. So alongside voting for them, we said the workers and oppressed need to build class struggle action committees to fight to achieve their basic demands for land, jobs and industrialisation. This does not sound like a call for, for strategic unity with bourgeois nationalism. But all the IBT can do is stand on the sidelines, hurl denunciations of uh, so-called popular frontism because they have no perspective to dirty their hands with intervening into the actual struggles of the working class and oppressed with the intention of breaking them from their existing liberal and nationalist misleaderships and guiding them toward the fight for socialist revolution. But that is what it takes if you are really serious about fighting for socialist revolution. Thanks, comrade. <laughs> Speaker from the IBT. Thank you, my name is Mal. In the last year, the Spartacists have rediscovered the critical support tactic, engaging in a dizzying array of different electoral blocks with bourgeois workers' parties, small reformist groupings, and even some petty bourgeois nationalists. Some of these blocks aren't unprincipled, but taken together, these instances aren't just tactical. You've told us plainly, this is a global strategy. Marxists must search the world for electoral formations to attach themselves to, like male Anglicists and anything less is abstention from the class struggle. In Germany and in the United States, the Spartans support small Stalinoid outfits, the DKP and Marseillite PSL, respectively. In France and in Greece, you argue the mess of small reformist groupings must unite against the far right and EU. In Australia, you call to kick out the AUKUS hawks from the ALP leadership, in doing so, critically supporting the opposing faction of the independent Australian imperialists. In all cases, the average worker hasn't heard of these forces or doesn't care for the struggle. In left-wing communism, Lenin described situations to employ the critical support tactic, where the majority of workers have illusions in reformism, where calling for to vote for future class traders gains us a hearing we wouldn't otherwise get, and where all the parties of the bourgeoisie have drawn a class line against reformism. Sure, one might occasionally give a tactical vote in other circumstances, but the Leninist approach to critical support is clear, and it is not a strategy for all situations. In Britain, the New Spartans have simultaneously called for labour rights to remain in labour to kick out the Zionist leadership and for workers to vote for the Departees. You, should, you also call to support the Socialist Party front Tusk, even after they kick you out for rightly criticising their line on screws. And you support George Galloway's Workers' Party, a populist mess propped up by transphobia, anti-migrant racism and support pinched from UKIP as much as its reformist demands. Sure, you criticise them but in the same article, laud their opposition to the liberal woke left and say anyone who refuses to vote for them is a liberal themselves. You can see that there are some candidates so dodgy that even you don't support them, a tacit admission that the Workers' Party is an unprincipled block with elements alien to the workers' movement. It's this latter alliance that has led to the shameful sight of Spartacists in Union Jack colours, hocking Galloway's Britain deserves better pamphlets, while your own material argues that workers must unite to fix broken Britain Softening on nationalism is a predictable consequence of blocking against perceived liberalism at all costs, and it has led you to don the red, white, and blue rosette as you drum up votes for a party that promises to unleash the Royal Navy on migrants. 
what is the sum of this global strategy? Instead of positioning you as a serious independent grouping that sometimes votes for flawed programs to gain a hearing, you will be dismissed as serial parasites desperately seeking any marginally larger host, even a diseased one. The message sent to workers will not be that they need to engage in struggle one and minute. break movements away from reformist leaderships as you hope, but that politically blocking with reformist leaderships is an essential stage in the recomposition of a revolutionary party, which must take place in every country. This, like so much New Spartacus politics, represents a centrist overcorrection of the mistakes of the Robertson years. You've rediscovered one tactic, but not when to stop using it. Our job isn't to zigzag between abstentionism and liquidation like this, but to plot a course through. Thank you. Thank you, Comrade. <laughs> Comrade Gates. My name's Bill Keats. Um, I support the politics of Owen Gager. In 1976, we formed Communist Left, which had been active till about 2020. Um, I joined Communist Left because Owen had the answers on the 1975 constitutional crisis. He linked the political issues, the bourgeois democratic issues, with the socialist issues, with the mobilisation of the working class into a, into a strategy for working class power. He showed that the Republic in Australia could only be achieved by the expropriation of the ruling class by the establishment of a revolutionary government. I found this basically the most sensible explanation of strategy of revolutionaries in the, what is the most serious, important upsurge in my lifetime. Now, talk about Owen's eclecticism. However, in some ways, we have been consistent. We have supported militarily the PLO against Israel. We have supported the, the IRA in their military struggle against British imperialism with no faith in the political leaderships of those bourgeois formations. The Spartans League have changed and changed for the better. In my view, hooray. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, the so-called interpenetrated peoples is a piece of revisionism, um, which I'm glad they've dished. Now, I have a question for Bill Logan. Australasian Spartans in 1976, I think it was, says all Nationalism is genocidal and reactionary. I have can find a, a quote from Trotsky concerning the Vietnamese and the Chinese, which, which directly repudiates that. So it is directly, that quote from Asp is directly counterposed to Trotsky. Trotsky says it's a bourgeois, it says a, quote, a similar quote is ahistoric, and he considers it a bourgeois progressive movement, and there lies the danger of liquidation in into bourgeois nationalism. In no way does Trotsky suggest one should liquidate into bourgeois nationalist formations. Now, the point is, if, if Bill Logan agrees with that, he's counterposed to Trotskyism. If he disagrees, he exposes the changes in the Spartans League, and that the Spartans League at that stage was revisionist on the national question. Now, the three issues which are raised in terms of Spartans revision, the national question is one of them. Well, I'm glad they've changed. I'm not. Um, I agree with the hell of a lot my personal comrade said. Um, the other is the general strike, in which the Spartans League at one stage argued you could have a defensive general strike. Trot, this was in 1976, concerning the Nettigate upsurge in Australia. Uh, Trotsky says that a general strike requires uh, workers' militias and preparation... One minute. For, ...and preparation for the will of... from the defensive to the offensive. This is counterposed to a defensive... General strike, and the other issue I would raise, if I had more time, was economism. Now, in terms of the Latrobe Valley strikers for a wage rise of $109, the Spartans League considered that a political struggle. Now, no, it is an economic struggle. An economic struggle is a struggle for a, sex, for a sectorial of working class for a limited gain. A political struggle is a generalised struggle for the whole of society. No, it was an economic struggle, and Trotsky argues against confusion with political and economic, and frankly, you do not understand economism. I do not un have the space, time to exp argue, explain all these differences. However, I have written uh, a pamphlet which is online called Marxism in the Sparsus League. Uh, see the Communist Left um, website, Yola site. Um, 
and we have con consistently had a, That's time, a principled critique of the Sparse League on so many levels and on some issues like Ireland and Palestine. I'm glad you're coming over to our side. Thank you, comrade. <laughs> All right, the next round, first speaker from the Spartacist League. And look, there's plenty to talk about, but I think I want to get bring it down at first to method and like the two kind of differentiating methods that have been put forward by the two speakers today. Uh, the IBT tells us that re what is revolutionary leadership? Revolutionary leadership is about drawing lines that you don't cross. And that, that's the fundamental thing. Drawing a line is not really leading anything. You know, revolutionary leadership is about confronting the obstacles in front of the advance of the working class movement. It's, it's about exploiting the contradictions that we find in the society around us to advance an independent proletarian position. Uh, and, you know, the recognition of class lines is, is part of that, but, it, you know, the, the IBT sterilizes it into this totally unactionable, you know, thing that, you know, we, we go up to this point and then we don't cross this line. That's, that's not nothing. That is not revolutionary <laughs> leadership. And that is kind of the sterility that I think the, the whole reorientation, the whole rearming of the Spartacus League has been part of rejecting. And, you know, I, I think we've got to also go back. There's a bit of obfuscation from what, you know, the IBT actually has a perspective on, on nationalism, you know, may, maybe not. You know, nationalism, the IBT puts it that nationalism is this purely reactionary thing, you know, genocidal uh, force in every state. I want to quote from Spartacism Junked, where you say that uh, the ICL has finally embraced Pabloite revisionism uh, that the founders of the Spartacist League fought against. Indeed, according to the ICL, only sectarians denounce bourgeois nationalism in oppressed countries as simply reactionary. And uh, Ernest Mandel would be pleased, that's what you say. So for the IBT, let's be clear here, the nationalism of the oppressed is simply reactionary, and to say otherwise is Pabloite, is centrist, is liquidationist, et cetera, et cetera. There is nothing progressive in the national stirring against colonial subjugation, in national revolt against imperialism. It's simply reactionary. There are no contradictions. There's nothing to champion. There's nothing to push forward towards a whole confrontation with the, towards a confrontation with the whole imperialist system. It's just a question to take off the agenda as soon as possible. That's the ultimate core of kind of the profoundly flattening, totally anti-Leninist distortion of permanent revolution, which the IB, uh, ICL has rejected. We stand on the politics of Lenin. We put it quite succinctly in reference to the Comintern's thesis on the national and colonial questions. What is the most important, the fundamental idea of our thesis? It is the difference between the oppressed and oppressor nations. We emphasize this difference in contrast to the second international and to bourgeois democracy, end quote. If you do not emphasize this difference, you're incapable of challenging the nationalism of the oppressed, which you consider to have no contradictions to be a purely reactionary uh, thing to get off the agenda. And I, I think, you know, we, there's plenty of examples that have been brought up by the IBT. One minute. We can definitely go on to Iran, you know. Um, this is a question about how to fight imperialism, you know, and how to fight the treacherous and reactionary national bourgeoisie. Um, and I want to, you know, what, what is our line on Iran? It's not a question of us repudiating that Khomeini and the mullahs were reactionary, that the left cynically and, and criminally capitulated to them. We were right to denounce that. But our, the problem was our program. We had no way to intervene as a revolutionary force to actually split uh, the, working, the workers who had illusions in this, in this uh, reactionary, reactionary anti, you know, force on the basis of their anti-imperialism. Because what we could say was, no, we should be organized as a class. Look, these Islamic reactionaries are Islamic reactionaries. That's not going to convince anyone to break from uh, these forces. You have to actually wage a fight to show how they are a barrier to the justly felt aspirations for, you know, the end of the Shah, the end of uh, which was represent, uh, who, which was viewed, who was thank viewed you, as a representative of imperialism. So, thank you. Uh, representative the IBT. Thank you, Gomez. My name is Max Shada. I am based in Wellington, New Zealand, and I have been with the IBT for about a year now. Now, the Wellington branch of the IBT has grown in the last few years. We are still a tiny fighting propaganda group, but we are cohering a modest number of serious people around our revolutionary program. 
I and others of the comrades you see here today were won in no small part by the IVT's exemplary participation in the trans struggle, a field of intensifying struggle that is plagued by liberal risk-averse leadership and abandoned by much of the leadership of the working class. Within this domain, the IVT has fought for mass mobilizations to protest against the increasing number of anti-trans speaking events and marches, frequently butting heads with those who defer to NGOs and the parliamentary left, and has fought to draw the unions into the struggle. Our work culminated last year in a rally of over 4,000 people opposing the far-right affiliated terse Kelly J. Keane, the largest rally in Wellington of that year and the largest pro-trans rally in the country ever. Furthermore, our youth wing at Victoria University, Wellington, which I am a part of, was a significant force in revitalizing a student worker protest movement in opposition to substantial program and job cuts last year. Within this movement, we staged a sharp intervention in favor of a militant working class perspective. Small and with only a tiny base in the union, we ultimately lost the fight to initiate a strike due to the sabotage of the bureaucrats and the reformist left, but in doing so, the radically minded of the student body and junior staff saw us expound and fight to implement our program. Key in both of these struggles has been the tactic of the United Front. We leverage the speaking opportunities to expose students and staff and the thousands that showed up for trans people to our revolutionary perspective, while also fighting for definite demands and actions along all, alongside all those who are willing to join in without expecting participants to accept our wider program and political perspectives. This allows radically minded people under reformist leadership to witness our program in action. Indeed, on and off campus, we have gradually developed a reputation as the org that is consistently for militant trade unionism, that is willing to criticize the union bureaucracy and the parliamentary left, and is willing to demand more than the scraps they offer. This reputation continues to allow us to develop around us a periphery, some of whom are on their way to becoming good communists in their own right. What I want to highlight is that the fight against liberalism and laborism, laborism growth, winning people to a revolutionary consciousness, they do not necessitate, and in fact cannot include trading away the principles of class independence and honesty to the working class that the Spartacist League was built on in its revolutionary period. The fusion documents One minute. between the former Bolshevik Leninist and the ICL speak of the ICL offering direction after Bolshevik Leninist's years of stagnation. But the direction they offer is one of abandoning the revolutionary program in favor of scrambling liquidationist maneuvers, not one of fighting for its implementation. You charge us with not doing anything. I disagree. Yeah. Thank you, comrade. Um, for the next uh, organizational speaker, I'll use my moderator's prerogative to ask a question on behalf of Platypus which in some sense also is influenced by the Spartacist tradition. Um, I was thinking about uh, Comrade Logan's comment that we don't have anything new to say. Um, the revolutionary tendency was in its sort of founding document uh, in defense of a revolutionary perspective, cites James Cannon's um, 1946 speech, uh, um, the thesis on the American uh, Revolution, that ultimately upholds some kind of revolutionary optimism about the, the possibility of the revolution taking place in America, or that America would be the epicenter of the post-war revolutionary struggle. Um, by 1962, when In Defense of a Revolutionary Perspective is, is written, in some sense that prognosis hadn't come, hadn't borne fruit. Nevertheless, the revolutionary tendency held that the position was still correct, that there, there needs to be some orientation towards the possibility of the American or a, a, an American revolution being the leader in the coming uh, proletarian revolution or socialist revolution. So my question would be, how do we understand today the tasks of revolution, let's say even within America or within the imperialist core? Is there anything new to say about those possibilities or is there some fealty to war or some uh, revitalization of in defense of a revolutionary perspective today. Thank you. 
Um, and now we'll go back to the next round of questioning. I'll ask uh, the Spartacus League to speak next. Yeah, so um, uh, the speeches by the IBT uh, today have, uh, I think, proved in spades that they have really nothing to offer by way of revolutionary leadership today. Uh, from South Africa to Palestine, uh, you don't fight to drive forward the struggle of South African uh, workers to expose the EFF. You don't champion the national liberation struggle anywhere. And you spit on the, 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 the most classic and best example of revolutionary leadership in the whole of the ICL's history when we intervened into the DDR and uh, in the Soviet Union uh, fighting for a red, uh, Germany in, uh, in, uh, red Germany in a socialist Europe and to mobilise workers to defeat uh, Yeltsin and George Bush's uh, counter-revolution. Um, Charlotte mentioned the IBT's work in the imperialist centres regarding Palestine, the burning question today. Uh, they're lauding, if you look at their website, they laud the union bureaucracy, uh, uh, the Otago Rail and Maritime Union, because this person said a few words about workers withdrawing labour. In a May statement, the IBT claimed that unions in Australia have heard, heeded the calls, um, have heeded the calls for... Uh, um, f of the Palestinian Federation. What nonsense is this? This could only be referenced to the leadership of the Maritime Union, the AMWU and the CFMEU who peddle fine words to defend Palestinian rights at Sunday rallies and then during the week they go back to protecting their privileged position in the labour movement while shoring up the very labour government which is backing the Zionist terror. These left-talking union tops at the IBT and others and other so-called socialist groups praise have not lifted a finger to mobilise their working class base against the genocide. They are the key barrier to unleashing the social power of the working class in defence of the Palestinians because they refuse to break with Albanese, Penny Wong and the rest of the pro-imperialist scoundrels in the labour movement who in turn are wedded to Australian capitalism and the US alliance. In contrast to the IBT, the SLA have fought to defend Palestine by breaking the US connection in the workers' movement and by chucking the US lackeys out of the ACTU and the ALP. We fought to break the political block of socialists, left-talking union tops and the ALP leadership, which subordinates the working class to the capitalist rulers. Against the union tops that the IBT sucks up to, we have fought to build a revolutionary anti-imperialist pole in the unions and the left based on the Leninist principle that there can be no unity with labour imperialist statesmen. Now, I've got another example which uh, one of the uh, IBT uh, people mentioned. The upcoming, the upcoming British elections. Our comrades in Britain have been waging a struggle for months to maximise the anti-labour uh, to maximise the anti-labour vote, vote, to build a working class opposition to Starmer's labour. We've done this by supporting working class opponents of Starmer, such as Galloway's part, Workers' Party and the Trade Union and Socialist Coalition. In doing so, we have been and are fighting to lay the basis for a principled fight back against the Labor government. From, uh, and this working class united front effort against Starmer based on fighting on a fighting program of opposition to the monarchy and workers running the country aims to weaken a future Starmer government while at the same time exposing the Little England program of its opponents, such as the TUSC, who peddle support to prison guards and the Workers' Party who embrace the Union Jack. Contrast that with the IBT statement on the British elections. It is completely divorced from any intervention. That's time, comrade. Thank you. Next, the comrade from the IBT. Yes. We can just no use. Uh, I think you should use the mic. If that's all right. I think. That's right. My dear Hannah, I joined the Spartacist tendency in 1970, and together with Bill Logan, I was the leader of the Spartacist League of Australia from 1972 to 1977. We were expelled at the Colchester Spartacist Conference. In, 19, in 1979, and have been vilified and slandered by Spartacists ever since. While we made many mistakes during that period, 
We made them in, col in collaboration with the international leadership, particularly Jim Robertson. And we have acknowledged those mistakes, but the ICL never has. The international leadership was fully informed about life and activity of the section. Lots of money was spent to get witnesses against Logan to that trial. And I was his only witness um, against the trial and for him. And while at that time I was living illegally in New York, working part-time, so I had no money. Robertson said my presence was not needed at the trial as there were no charges against me. Robertson lied. I was on trial, I was expelled, and both my expulsion and bills were travesties. The specific issue which, may, which had been given most prominence over the years is the accusation that Bill Logan pressured a young woman to have an abortion. Bill had little involvement during that pregnancy. The couple, David and Vicky and I, were the only comrades in Melbourne in 1972 when David told me that Vicky was having problems with her pregnancy. The doctor advised them to let nature take its course. David said he did not want a baby and asked what he should do. I telephoned New Zealand and discussed this, not with Bill, but with Joel Salinger, a more experienced Spartacist recently arrived from the SLUS where he had been an alternate member of the Central Committee. Joel and I took the side of David and the doctor and I passed that information on to David who acted as the go-between with Vicky. By the time the rest of the uh, comrades from New Zealand arrived in January 73, Vicky's pregnancy had stabilised. At that point, Bill talked on the telephone with Robertson and then put the core points of that discussion in a letter to him which is publicised in the ICL's own account. As a result of this communication, the Spartacist League of the US paid for David to travel to the US and work there until the baby was born. In the event, he stayed away for a further three months. Three yeah, months. So, at Colchester, Robertson claimed he knew nothing about this. This is another lie. The Sri Lankan Trotskyist Edmund Samrakodi was on the trial body in Colchester, a centrist but an honourable comrade of unimpeachable integrity. He was appointed precisely because of the authority his presence would give to the proceedings. Sam Riccardi noted that the international leadership had a long-standing campaign against Bill Logan. He identified serious procedural inadequacies. He said his own questioning of witnesses proved the involvement of the whole leadership of the Australian section. And while Sam Riccardi said Logan was guilty of most of the charges, so was everybody else. And, right, now this, what, Tom, shut up, my turn, right. The conclusions um, that Sam Riccardi would make would jeopardise his the ability to join the Spartacist League. But that was the truth as he saw it. And that is the truth I see, as I see it. The question is, how do you see it, comrades? You of the Spartacist League, this is your history and you have a, a necessity to account for it. Thank you, comrade. Quiet. No interjections from the floor. Um, we have an imperative to take questions from organisations, so I'll take Ruben from the RCO next, and then in the final round, I'll take the comrade in the front row here um, after another round of similarities. Ruben, please. Okay. Thank you, comrades. I'm... Uh, so just wondering, I feel like our discussion here has kind of gotten away from the questions of permanent revolution and saying, there's obviously going back to this issue of party, like party building. So we're talking about revolutionary leadership here, but without a revolutionary party, without the unity of the working class and the unity of the socialist movement on a principled basis, which is what permanent revolution, opposition to things like state loyalism as it, this is kind of the heart of the debate should we support state loyalism from the pet like the petty bourgeois nationalists sort of thing um it's kind of really about but without the work to forge a principled regroupment of the socialist movement and without that work we can't really influence we can't 
be the revolutionary leadership. There are, I don't know, there are many, many, so it's like we were talking about the election in Britain. There are, I think, a ridiculous number of Trotskyist sects saying they are the revolutionary movement, leadership of the movement. They want to split workers from there. What we need functionally is a unity of the socialist movement to achieve that goal of revolutionary leadership. Um, also, I noticed nobody actually responded to <laughs> your question, Ryan, about uh, revolutionary optimism um, and the in the US. Yeah, um, I think it's an interesting question as vis a vis the imperial core and permanent revolution. Um, though, like, um, I'm, I'm not entirely sure, like, with that, and on those particular points. Um, but I think it'd be an interesting to think, discuss with the relation to the history of the Spartacist League. And you could argue for either, um, like, eventually impelling concrete, sorry, increasing contradictions of imperialism could cause that. Or you could argue against it on, like, more of a um, basis of concepts like the labor aristocracy. I'm not sure where your organizations stand on that. Uh, but my main point was that, like, clearly there's a history of uh, animosity between the organizations and this recent development is a buildup of that. But what we need to be working out is not on these differences around orientation. We need to be working towards the strategy of principled unity of the socialist movement to achieve the goal of revolutionary leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Comrade. Okay, this, <clears throat> it's a... Uh, 4.55, we have time for one more round and then we'll do uh, closing statements. Uh, I'll start with someone from the Spartacist League. Yeah, I, I want to come back to this point about the British uh, uh, elections. Um, the IBT make a big polemic against our attempts to maximise worker opposition to Starmer claiming that this does nothing to break the hold of laborism. So how can the hold of laborism be broken according to the IBT? Well, according to these wiseacres, the way to break workers from laborism is, wait for it, show up to the election and spoil one's ballot. Such sterile sectarianism will guarantee that workers will never be broken from the pro-capitalist Labor Party. In fact, for all their rhetoric, uh, the IBT's position is, in fact, uh, really a case study in uh, sectarianism. While multiple individuals and groups in Britain today are trying to mobilise left campaigns against Starmer, the IBT pontificates on high, pushing liberal opposition to Galloway's backward ideas on social questions while proposing zero to advance the fight against Labor. What, I what is the reality? Galloway's Workers' Party is running a pro-Palestinian, pro-socialist candidates against Labor. People who vote for him want to oppose Starmer centrally over Gaza and the IBT's response is to dismiss this, thus capitulating to Labor. This is in line with the IBT's tailing of the left union bureaucrats over Palestine which is a capitulation to the New Zealand Labor Party and the ALP here who have and continue assisting in the genocide in Gaza. So from Wellington to Melbourne to London, the IBT's approach to the obstacles to revolutionary struggle in the Labor movement is frankly pathetic. For our part, we will continue to fight for a revolutionary pole within the Labor movement with the view of building the revolutionary party that the world's working class so desperately needs. Thank you. <laughs> Representative of the IBT. Thank you again. Uh, I wanted to respond to some of the points in the SL's opening speech in particular. It was claimed that we consider national liberation bourgeois and unsupportable. That is slander. We wish to be active in national liberation struggles. We call for workers' actions to bring about the military victory of national liberation forces in Kanaki. We would work within the national liberation demonstrations and in more militant mobilizations. The key point, and one that the SLA does not seem to get, is that interventions into national liberation struggles have to retain independence. And to be independent, one has to retain strategic flexibility. Strategic blocks 
of the kind, such as the anti-imperialist United Front, threaten that strategic flexibility and thus that independence. This misunderstanding uh, uh, of, uh, leads to other distortions of our program. The idea that we would only block with revolutionaries in the anti-imperialist struggle is another lie. We are for blocks with reformist and bourgeois forces, some of the time, but also blocks against them. One cannot present a ready-made formula that one will always find national bourgeois bloc partners in the neo-colonies, and that this kind of bloc has a strategic importance over and above blocks against them. On 1948, it is historically illiterate to suggest that the Spartacist dual defeatist position on the 1948 war adopted in 1974 meant dual defeatism between Israel and the Palestinians undergoing the Nakba. You are ignorant of your own history. This was a position of dual defeatism between Zionist fighters and the Arab armies from surrounding countries, no less tied to imperialism, no more capable of liberating the Palestinians. Of course, we are for the defense of the Palestinian homes of the Nakba, just as the SL was. But uh, the means of doing so would have been for working class action against uh, a lot across sectarian lines, such as occurred in the port of Haifa, and which was on the cards, not a block with, uh, with the foreign Arab armies. You allege that we would, weren't uh, opposed to Zionist settlement of the Middle East. Of course we were, and of course the SL was, and everyone in the Trotskyist movement uh, up to a certain point. Um, but by 1948, the Hebrew-speaking nation in Palestine was a fact, and that had to be worked with. And yes, that nation has and had democ national democratic rights. Only revolution can finally resolve the need for both uh, Israelis and Palestinians for national democratic rights. To build that revolution, we also require tactical blocks, both for and against the forces like Hamas uh, at different times. Of course, we would not raise economic demands right now in a block against Hamas. The point is that we would, uh, th that this was appropriate at the time of those demonstrations in Gaza in early 2023. We have been accused of stagnant formulations, but it is the ideal who applies formula that threaten our flexibility and thus our independence. Thank you. Thank you, comrade. Uh, for the final speaker from the floor, comrade, I believe you had something you want to say. I'm good. My name is Michael Watkins, and I've um, <clears throat> been a long, long time member of the uh, Australian Labour Party. For many years, I was at the, at the left fringe of the party, coming together at election time to help Labour come back, back into government, and then get disappointed by their pro-capitalist policies. For many years, I, I've been a sympathiser of the Spartacist League, but never been a member. But, but uh, I do see, uh, uh, I'd like to know what the IBT think of the, uh, the tactic now of the Spartacist League to enter the Labour Party and call for the expulsion of pro-imperialist leaders. I think that's a good tactic. I think it's... A, it's because I believe, particularly in my own branch in, in the in the uh, uh, in Oakley, the Oakley branch, that there are members in that branch that feel the same way as I do. That this AUKUS, this nuclear submarines, the 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 drive, the war drive against China, is something they don't like. I mean, uh, I, I, it's, Im it's important to, <coughs> to get amongst work, workers in their, in, their, in, their, in their labor branches and, and <coughs> bring about <coughs> a, a split of genuine socialists away from the from the pro-capitalist right wing of the Labour Party and um, build, a, build a revolutionary workers' party. I think it's a good tactic to, rather than yes. ignore it and 
throw up, throw up um, revolutionary slogans against reformism, but not getting amongst the, the, the members who might be looking for a way out of the ping pong of liberal labor, liberal labor coming back in, alternating in power with no real advance for the worker. Thank you. Thank you, comrade. <laughs> okay, that concludes our five rounds of questions from the floor. Um, we are a little ahead of time, so if both parties agree, I'm happy to award each party two extra minutes for closing statements if, th if they would like to use it, if that's appropriate. Okay, so, you so first up for closing statements, we have the IBT, which will have 11 minutes and 16 seconds. Just thank you, and thank you for the various contributions from the floor. Um, I would like to start by talking about your um, repeated denunciations of the line in Theses on Ireland about removing the national question from the agenda. Specifically, I want to say your objections are a facile misunderstanding of our position that is of a piece with the rest of your new term. You have extrapolated from that line an attitude towards national struggle in toto. What it is, is a position in relation to the national struggles of interpenetrated peoples. The full line, again, is, we support the right of self-determination and national liberation struggles in order to remove the national question from the historic agenda, not to create another such question. What do you think creating another such question means outside of that specific context? One of your contributions held up Lenin's support for the Easter Rising as some kind of checkmate against us, but we maintain that position. It is not at all in contradiction with our views. The, th the position of interpenetrated peoples in Northern Ireland was created after the Irish Civil War, not before. The theory of interpenetrated peoples is um, not relevant to supporting the Easter Rising. Our position in that regard, interpenetrated peoples, is not, as you seem to believe, inherently alienating to people of oppressed nationalities. In fact, it amazes me that you can even ask a question like, how the hell are you going to win workers from Indonesia on the old line of Spartacism? I don't know, ask the Indonesian se section of revolutionary regroupment if your new course is the necessary correction against Robertsonite chauvinism, and it is obvious that no worker in places like Indonesia or Brazil could be won to that old spot line, why didn't you bring these neo-colonial sections with you when you fused with the, IS the ICL? Why was it your one section in an imperialist country? What have you won in the neo-colonies through this term, comrades? On the point about breaking with nationalism, we are not particular about the exact borders of Israel. What we maintain is that there is an Israeli nation and it has national rights. You don't seem to disagree with that, so in a lot of your objections, I'm not really sure what your point is overall. We are for communists fighting for leadership of the national liberation, in uh, the national liberation struggle in Palestine and Apparently, like you, we are for fusing that struggle with class struggle in Israel. It is fairly easy to answer your question, whose side are the workers on in the Nakba? Amal already laid it out quite well. Your point about the slogan, from the river to the sea, is interesting, not because of the point you're trying to make in particular, but because your argument appears to be um, that we're exiling ourselves from the pro-Palestinian movement over whether we do or don't endorse a slogan. A chant. There's no greater proof of a tailist mindset. We do not deny that the national struggle is key to revolution in the neo-colonies. If you listened to what I said, you would have heard me endorse your old South African section making a statement along those lines. It is perfectly possible to actively intervene in the anti-imperialist struggle without giving any support at all to the bourgeois nationalists. We have done so in the past and we will do it again. 
And we have never once denied that national revolution can be the motor force of a revolutionary struggle. That is, in many ways, at the heart of permanent revolution. But it can only be done through an intransigent opposition to the national bourgeoisie. This allows for alliances with the national bourgeoisie on certain points of common interest for a limited time. What it does not allow for is the full endorsement of a bourgeois political program because left-leaning masses hold illusions in it. Your um, writings about the EFF are very telling in this regard. Your criticisms are all about how the EFF will fight for its program, not what it is fighting for. Are we to conclude that the ICL believes the Economic Freedom Fighters program is adequate? It isn't. You can expose the national bourgeoisie without giving them political support. You can expose any um, reformist or bourgeois formation without doing that. In fact, it staggers me that you seem to believe this is the only way one can combat mass illusions in these groups. You castigate us for calling for no vote in the British election, saying our position does nothing to expose Labour. But you have leaned so far into your critical support that, as Amal mentioned, we are now faced with the scandal of British Spartacists decked out in British flags. You cannot possibly claim to be combating the, li the little Englandism of certain sections of the British working class while you are draped in a Union Jack. And what on earth message does that send to the victims of British imperialism around the globe? For all your arguments about the sterility of our line, your attempts to maximize opposition to the Labour Party appear to begin and end at the ballot box. In fact, all you have done is prove your new focus on opportunist electoralism. Our comrades in Britain do plenty of work outside the voting booth. And the fact you think this all amounts to no work at all shows you're losing your way on what the real work of communists is. Our primary job is not to go and find left-leaning parties to vote for. And in fact, a lot of the parties you've managed to find are pretty dubious in their class politics to start with. In practice, a workers' party vote is only a class vote if one doesn't consider migrant workers, trans workers, etc., to be on our side of the line. And an EFF vote is only a class vote if one considers that petty bourgeois nationalists are. I'm not sure you have a clear idea of what a class line is anymore. Um, I'd like to close out by responding to an RCO member. I would also very much like to discuss the transitional program. It is much neglected and it actually provides very useful keys to um, intervention in and winning the leadership of all sorts of struggles. We've put its principles to um, use in very effective ways in queer struggles in New Zealand, which is why um, all the, uh, the, the younger people who we've sent across today are trans in some way or other. Um, but I would like to take that up after the debate also, if that is all right. It would be quite a segue at this point. Um, and that's it from me. Thanks. You have four minutes, comrade. Four minutes. Because the chairman from Platypus asked, is, I think he was asking, is revolution on the cards? And yeah, of course there are times when things are going against us and there are times when things are going uh, in our direction. Uh, and the fact is that we have recovered, or we are starting to recover from, a period in which the po chances of revolution have been quite slim or the levers towards it have been fewer than uh, there are at other times. But there is an upsurge in struggle. Uh, and I think that this is something which the comrades from the Spartacist League pick up on usefully, that there is an upsurge in struggle and that we have got to join in the struggle. Great. But I think that is all they're saying. Um, we have got to join in the struggle. And the question is, on what program? And they wave their, 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 their thing saying that program, but uh, the, 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 the actual content is merely to say, join in. The actual content is merely to say, there is a national struggle and we have got to 
Don't do that, please. Papa. So it, it is important to to actually say what what you will do. Yeah, we want to join the national struggle. Absolutely. We'd be stupid not to. Anyone on the left must join the national struggle. But the question is whether you're going to join in the national struggle as it is or are you going to try and draw a class line in it? Uh, and the, um, that is going to have to be through the transitional program. Someone was asking, what would, uh, it was perhaps one of the RCO comrades, uh, what, was, what would a revolutionary leadership do in the national program? And it's a thing that's very difficult to give an answer to because the national program, national uh, struggle is so different in, in each situation. Nationalism is contradictory. It's certainly not reactionary through and through. It's certainly very often highly revolutionary in a way which can uh, make the transition to, to, to communist revolution. But there's no automatic process that goes on. And that's, that's what we're trying to uh, introduce into the conversation, a sense of how you make this transition to communist politics. And that, that, does, that means doing something to change the struggle that is. I, I actually think as I stand back a little from the discussion this afternoon, that what we have here is a difference on the kind of way we're going to build an organization. It seems to me that the Spartacist League overall is trying to build an organization from the bottom up. That it's trying to, trying to say, right, we're going to lead the working class at Thirty seconds. Uh, and we want to give a program for the working class as a whole. Now, we obviously want to have a program that we want the working class as a whole to adopt, but we see the importance of doing what is possible in the best possible way now. So this idea of promiscuous critical support is going to actually mean no real uh, uh, critical support anywhere. Because if you're trying to critically support 20 different organizations, you're not actually going to critically support any of them. Comrade. And so no one is going to know what, how to critically support. Thank you. <laughs> yep. uh, last, Charlotte from the uh, SL with 12 minutes. Uh, firstly, Bill, on, on all nationalism is reactionary, I say what you're saying, uh, that's not your line. I suggest you read what you publish on your website on nationalism of the oppressed. So uh, I think you kind of gave it away and your whole thing is doing what is possible in the best possible way now, as in to preach these little lines to convince your little circle of these broad abstract Marxist principles while not actually fighting for revolutionary leadership today. Uh, I think, uh, I think on, there was a lot of obfuscation on the net. It's not about, or oh, do you put your leg in, do you put your leg out on the national liberation struggle? Do you see it as a motor force for the re for revolution? And do you look to combine it with proletarian revolution? We have penned plenty of words denouncing us, but now you're suddenly saying, oh yeah, actually we do all this. Actually, we emphasize throughout the entire space for communist leadership of the anti-imperialist struggle. We are fighting for class independence from start to bottom. So I would like to go into a few of these things. Uh, uh, how to say? Uh, Hmm. Uh, yeah, so I think there's a lot of things uh, briefly on uh, Israel and Hamas. We do take a military side. We said we, we are for putting maximum military pressure on the IDF. That includes taking a military side with Hamas. That's not the be all end all though. Uh, that's it's actually the key thing is fighting for communist leadership. Uh, so I think, uh, I think uh, you, Amal, you brought up a lot of baloney, I think, but ultimately, I think you did double down. You, it's not about the 1948 war as legitimate borders and all, but you actually uh, co co correlate the Zionist state, as you say, based on the expropriation and genocide as Palestinians, 
as a core part of the Jewish nation. You put an equal sign between them. So yes, I think you do treat it as there is a core part of the Zionist state that is def uh, you must defend when it comes down to it. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, so I, I think this is how, how it is like when you say, oh, not to create new questions, what you mean is reversing the terms of oppression. So the whole question of championing the struggle of Palestinian liberation, the, the central task of the uh, of revolution in the region is uh, like we have to, oh, we can't, we can't really champion it because then we would, uh, it would reverse the, we, would, we might possibly reverse the uh, terms of oppression. I think, uh, I, and I really would like to emphasize this question of, uh, of uh, how to say, uh, uh, the, the title, Permanent Revolution, what uh, and how do we, and the fight for revolutionary leadership today. I think this is a question that talks about the great strength, uh, you know, like of the, of the neo colonies, of revolution in the neo colonies. And like what you put forward in uh, your presentation, uh, Bill, is not a single word of how to actually fight for revolutionary leadership or not in the neo colonies. You just wrote, said some bizarre fan fiction on SL history. This is, it's ridiculous. And I, I, I think this whole bringing up a hundred different stuff by the IPT is really quite indicative of the difference in method. For the IPT, what matters isn't what to put forward today, our program, but actually to have some unsullied blag to brag about on their website. What is the point, or what, what is the point of what they put forward? That we are bureaucratic? We have already said that there have been bureaucratic expulsions in the past. Or how about the trade union caucuses? Right now, we have trade union caucuses from the US to Germany. What are you doing? Uh, you say we had prestige politics and can't admit mistakes? We have an in-depth explanation of our mistakes, not just the past 30, but 50 years. And unlike the IBT, we actually pointed out what was programmatically wrong and how it applies for the fight for revolutionary leadership today. It, <coughs> and really, what I think our whole, uh, our whole problem with your method is put on show like today. You, know, like, you brought up a whole bunch of history, but you never actually put forward how to actually how to actually advance the struggle today, and actually you gave it away with your slander of uh, the, s the second and fourth uh, Congress, which I would like to uh, quickly refer to. I think like you say, uh, Trotsky's drops uh, essentially the thesis of the Easter question, the fourth Congress in 1927. And you have, uh, and, and uh, are pretty open that uh, the commentants line on the semi and me colonies are wrong. And to do this, you have to like distort the fourth Congress and attack it as an opportunist. But in fact, your slander of it is actually the same as the Stalinists. The same the the, the Stalinists had the, the line uh, on the second and fourth Congress in the Comintern, and that the Trotskyists broke from that. So uh, and on this thing on the on the on what you're fighting for, on the EFF, I would like to say, uh, I think the whole thing is all oh, what you're fighting for. Actually, what part of the EFFs? like the Freedom Charter that you actually uh, oppose? Is it the peace, the land, or the bread? Because what the EFF doing is putting for, they, they have their own demands, and we are actually trying to show that they are unable, unable to achieve their own demands. Uh, like as, as uh, Trotsky said, the Bolshevik Leninists are not unmasked before the native masses, the inability of the Congress to achieve the realization of even its own demands because of a superficial conciliatory policy. In contradiction to the Congress, the Bolshevik Leninists developed a, pro a program of revolutionary class struggle. And that's the key. Uh, hmm. And I think the whole thing on the, the AUKUS, you say, oh yeah, we're giving support to the left bureaucracy. I think that's really hilarious, actually, because of our Chuck the AUKUS Hawks thing out. Uh, for a bit of context, what we're doing today, uh, we're trying to drive like Albanese and other uh, support of the U.S. alliance, a.k.a. like the people that are actually backing the genocide out of the workers' movement. This is actually, uh, like today, like there's all these honorable unions, dare I say, that, s that voice their support to Palestine. But they are actually, they, because of them, like all the support is going to them, but they are not actually striking for Palestine. They're not actually doing any black bans for Palestine. And the whole reason is because they don't want to upset their mates in like government and like it, what we've been doing our whole thing is actually to expose them and it, in contrast you you're like oh yeah you're, you're actually supporting them but meanwhile you're calling the you're calling the left labor rights the main political roadblock as honorable unions 
So this really shows the difference between our strategy. This is the definition of centrism. You have all these revolutionary words, you have all these revolutionary lines, but when it comes down to it, you actually don't have a kind of post-revolutionary policy. And I think this is the true from New Zealand, but also true throughout uh, the, uh, the neo-colonies. And, and actually, I, I really want to bring up something. Uh, but before I run out, I, I really do want to quickly address uh, a few of the people in the audience. Uh, I think, for example, uh, uh, RCO, what, what an example of communist leadership of the national liberation struggle. Well, I think a concrete example is what we were doing in Mexico with a him. Uh, like uh, previously, the HEM had previously dismissed nationalizations as nothing more than anti-worker measures. Maybe they say, oh, we support it, but it's like, it's like a tick box. It's not all, maybe it's like one tail end. Uh, in recent months, AMLO's proposed electrical reform event had a proposed event electrical reform, which eventuated to an offer of buying 13 power plants from the imperialists, a de facto nationalization with compensation of these funds. We didn't say, oh yeah, we support it. Oh yeah, we don't support it. Actually, we, not only we supported it, but we actually put forward a communist strategy calling to mobilize the working class to implement the reform and defend it from the imperialists through occupied energy plants and struggling for expropriation without cons compensations. Like, this is actually what it means to actually fight political independence in practice, not just a phrase, or we have had political independence. We're actually putting forward a political independence and putting forward a kind of post strategy to the national bourgeoisie in the struggle. And this is what revolutionary leadership uh, uh, is. Uh, and one more thing on junking everything Spartacists. I really want to talk about why we still call ourselves Spartacists because it actually was talked about a bit today. Uh, no, we actually aren't throwing out the baby to buy far forward. And I think really the best moment, what was a critical moment for the Spartacists was when counter revolution threatened the Eastern Bloc, the Spartacists put forward a program to fight for revolutionary leadership in the DDR and the Soviet Union against counter-revolution, against the Stalinist bureaucracy. We fought for political revolution, not in words, but deed. For all the criticisms you can have here and there and what have you, for us, political revolution and an unconditional defense of the worker state were not mantras you can tack on at the end of articles. It was a living, breathing struggle a real application of our program in the critical moment, and despite our small forces, due to the strength of our program, we had a real impact because of it. We fought our revolutionary leadership then, and now we have firmed the fight for revolutionary leadership in the neo-colonies. In truth, we are not junking everything good with the ICL. In fact, we have affirmed the best of it and extended it. Back then, the IPT, like today, sneered and belittled this fight for political revolution. Today, they sneer, similarly sneer at the fight of us using nat uh, national liberation as a motor force for revolution in the neo-colonies. For the IBT, revolutionary leadership, communism are all phrases they like to tack on at the end of articles, but are nothing but a mantra. This is the definition of centrism. Thank you. Okay, thank you, comrades. Can we get one round of applause for everyone again and everyone in the audience?